Good morning, everybody in the, the US, and uh, good afternoon, everybody in the uh, Kiev and elsewhere in uh, Europe. My name is Anders uh, Ostlan. I'm a, a senior fellow at the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic uh, the Council. And our uh, guest today is uh, uh, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture of uh, the Ukraine, Igor uh, P Petrashko. And uh, Igor is an old friend of mine, so it's a great pleasure to me to uh, have you as a guest uh, today. On the 17th of March, you uh, became a minister appointed by the Verkhovna Rada, the sound majority. And uh, uh, before, from, the, from 2013 to 2020, you worked as uh, Deputy uh, General Director and CFO of Ukrainian farming, the biggest Ukrainian agricultural uh, company. And you have also worked as a partner of uh, Ernst and Young. You have a wonderful uh, US uh, education as MBA of uh, uh, Vanderbilt uh, uh, University. So few are as well prepared as you for becoming uh, Minister for Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture an enormous uh, portfolio uh, covering everything that you can uh, think of uh, from uh, uh, trade, reg regulation, pri uh, privatization to agriculture. So my first question to you today, Igor, is uh, what do you see as your three biggest um, uh, goals? Uh, what do you want to achieve as a minister? This was a very uh, interesting and challenging uh, month for me there. So obviously I work in different uh, organizations, building teams, uh, working on uh, large uh, companies there, but the uh, government work is completely different there. So I uh, frankly never expected this to be that much different, but uh, I'm glad that I took this uh, responsibility because it was uh, really interesting and challenging. Uh, and I think this will actually go uh, go continue forward obviously like the first priority uh when i came was the start of the quarantine and uh, coronavirus fight in ukraine so um that's why many priorities has been shifted from uh like normal uh work to uh, ad hoc uh, solutions and decisions and support of uh, uh the people uh who uh, i need because we're also responsible for the uh, unemployment, uh, um, uh, the uh, organization, and uh, many of those uh, situations as well are under. Uh, were ne ne I'm sorry, I'm actually disconnect. Uh, uh, many of these situations uh, were requiring immediate attention. So the focus was first of all to support uh, businesses uh, and uh, communities. Uh, uh, when also talking to internal stakeholders, the cabinet of ministers, office of the president. Uh, so it was a kind of competition all the time there between the uh, like health and economy and everything there. So and, uh, as a minister of economy and agriculture, I was trying to uh, make sure that uh, the least harm is done to, um, to business that operate. Also, we understood clearly that uh, the lockdown needs to happen. And I think that's, uh, the story how we are actually going through it in Ukraine is one of the exceptional ones. But this was the first priority to make sure that the business uh, will suffer uh, uh, in the least possible ways. Like you remember, like those discussions on the opening of markets in Ukraine, uh, where people trade and uh, was was quite interesting and challenging. Now, second, uh, obviously, is uh, to come up with the uh, uh, solutions and suggestions how we can uh, support uh, the growth and uh, to solve the, uh, I would say, long-standing Ukrainian dilemma that uh, we do many right things, but at the same time, people are not uh, happy there and the economy is not growing and uh, we do like maybe small steps, but not uh, drastic steps. And um, that, that, that was uh, and is the first uh, main challenge uh, with uh, which I was coming to uh, lead the Minister of Economy there because uh, I kind of felt that uh, maybe um, I can uh, offer something uh, more fundamental, uh, how to solve those uh, 
uh, dilemmas and uh, make uh, the system work because uh, the first thing I came actually before I came as a minister of uh, economy, I read what the, min uh, the economic ministry should do in different countries. And uh, one of the main things is just to um, provide and to um, uh, create and uh, manage the conditions in which uh, the economic entities operate. And that is a very more important thing. So minister of economy currently manages many uh, things which uh, are not traditional, like state enterprises, which we should, which should be privatized, obviously, there, and, uh, but should be privatized in the right uh, manner there as well, uh, doing other things which uh, do not relate like to the managing of economy, but instead of reacting to ad hoc, uh, uh, ad hoc cases. So th that's why uh, that was my second uh, task, which I see as a minister is uh, to make sure that uh, we can build a system in which uh, economic decisions uh, made by different uh, ministries or the government itself in general or the parliament even as we actually uh, have a recommendation on voice and uh, our opinion matters for many of those economic decisions are made uh, in, in, in some um, uh, overall strategy lines there. So this is not like some random decisions. So we try to understand how the decision influence like the general economic climate. And third, um, and uh, it combines, it, it is, uh, I, I would define it actually as the uh, making sure that Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, companies, and not, not only Ukrainian, by Ukrainian I mean companies that operate in Ukraine, including foreign companies that operate in Ukraine, uh, um, have the uh, best competitive advantages compared to uh, neighboring countries. And uh, by creating competitive advantages, I mean different things there. So there are lines of things, obviously. We need to uh, get uh, higher in the uh, doing business ratings of, of different sources there, which we are uh, very low. And this includes the regulation, uh, rule of law, uh, privatization, um, uh, fiscal uh, stability, um, uh, labor code, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, all, all other and all, all important areas which uh, has been big progress has been done already, but insufficient as to my point of view there, because sufficient will be when the Ukraine will start growing eight plus percent per year in GDP, then I think uh, this would be sufficient and we can all rest. And I know Anders, you have been a big, uh, and you are a big uh, friend of Ukraine and big supporter of Ukraine and uh, most of many things in uh, Ukrainian policies has been done with your uh, advice there. And I think we all will be satisfied if we will see that Ukraine is growing like uh, eight plus percent, then we will say, okay, we've done the right things. And uh, now we can uh, do even more. So uh, that would be uh, three uh, areas uh, which uh, were in my head when I started uh, the, the, the job and uh, this continues. Obviously now there will be some, uh, uh, some um, amendments, corrections there, giving the new challenges there and new realities there. But that was actually uh, right the first day when I started uh, the work. Yeah, thank you very much, Igor. Uh, you froze for a few seconds on a few oh. occasions. Uh, let me just uh, summarize. But you, what I heard were three major uh, goals. Uh, first, uh, to handle the quarantine, to uh, keep the economy uh, going uh, and uh, health security. The second, to get the state enterprises into some order and private as is necessary. And third, they get a good business environment so that uh, Ukraine can really grow at a high speed at 8% or more. So the, let us take then the first uh, talk that you uh, discussed here that is the most uh, obvious, uh, that is uh, uh, how you uh, and the rest of the government are handling uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, President Zelensky just said in his uh, big uh, press conference that he thought that this was the area where Ukraine had really done uh, very well during his uh, first year. Before you answer, let me tell uh, uh, all the participants here that if you are on Zoom, you can use the question and answer uh, a mechanism. So please write uh, a question 
into the uh, Q&A uh, box, uh, and I will read out the questions as they uh, come up naturally in the uh, conversation. So mm -hmm. how is the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, and what are you doing about it? Anders, I, uh, my, my opinion, and I think this is a more or less opinion of the uh, expert communities, that the handling of the crisis uh, has been uh, uh, quite well there. Uh, if we're talking about the medical uh, situation, so Ukraine has a very decent uh, line uh, compared to the other countries, and uh, we are going in line, I think, with the best uh, European practices like Poland, um, like um, very close, and uh, some areas better, some areas are less. Uh, second of all, uh, we uh, have managed, I think, uh, economy as well, uh, with uh, least possible restrictions uh, there. And uh, we uh, have closed some of the areas, but we have not closed like all the economy there. We closed uh, some, uh, I would say, businesses which were most um, uh, hazardous, uh, taking into account like the potential spread of uh, infection. So all others, including the enterprises, industrial, agriculture, um, uh, have been opened. Uh, so we also uh, uh, acted quite fast in terms of reopening the economy. And we do hope that, uh, and are cautious obviously about this decision, but we have a plan. We have an adaptive quarantine there. We're monitoring everything on a daily basis there. And as well, making those decisions on a 10 day increments there, depending when we open something, we see if the trend and parameters that we put uh, for ourselves in terms of actually the uh, disease uh, are in line, then we're opening the next round. So far, it's working quite well and, and the right thing. Uh, I also um, praise uh, the government in terms of their not closing the export markets there. And there have been many voices there uh, to say that, oh, we need to close everything, the export agriculture and uh, stuff there. And uh, uh, just uh, there has been some pressure as well from uh, different associations in, in Ukraine and, and political uh, uh, forces to say, oh, let, let's do this. Russia closed it, uh, Belarus closed it, Romania closed it, and uh, some other countries actually are closing, so why not Ukraine? Uh, and we praise ourselves that we actually had this voice of reason and um, we did not. Uh, we had a memorandum with the grain traders there, which were a market uh, instrument there, and there are no complaints. And I think most of the associations uh, praising uh, uh, the government that was the, the most um, uh, I say efficient decision-making process during the crisis. Uh, we also introduced like the, because there was a law adopted by this, uh, the parliament there, in terms of the uh, price regulation. And we adopted this in the cabinet of minister in the most, uh, uh, I would say, uh, proper uh, way, uh, in a declarative way, instead of actually potentially coming to a, a wrong Soviet Union type of decisions when we would control prices. And this is also what government actually can take uh, price off, and uh, that was important. We maintained uh, price stability on the uh, food markets. Uh, and as well, we uh, managed that the supplies have not been interrupted. Because, you know, Ukrainians are always afraid that during the crisis there are some unexpected situations there and uh, that the, um, there is either price increases or government regulations unnecessary or shortages or other things. And uh, this hasn't happened. So I also think that it was a very important thing that the government uh, can <clears throat> Uh, praise uh, itself. Uh, we hope, uh, we count, we have the numbers to say that uh, this should continue in the same manner there because we are not over the coronavirus yet. Uh, we continue to open the economy there. Uh, now we actually need to continue to open the um, connections uh, with, with neighboring countries, but we never closed actually the uh, supply of goods and services there. Uh, and we uh, maintained uh, the European market with European uh, Union open all the time there in terms of the traffic, in terms of the uh, carriers, in terms of actually uh, trade. So this, this is important. 
Yeah, let me continue on this. I have here a question from Raymond uh, Baca uh, asking, could the influx of Ukrainian migrants from Poland and the place and pose a threat uh, to the country's uh, COVID response? But let me broaden the question. Uh, it has been a big discussion about migrants and remittances, uh, that remittances will be probably $3 billion uh, less this year, 2% of GDP or so. And uh, at the same time, there has been a big discussion about whether Ukrainian migrant workers can go for uh, summer work in various uh, uh, West European countries, well, it's uh, Poland, the, the UK, Sweden, uh, Finland, I think, particularly that have been mentioned. Uh, how do you look up on this? What is the government doing for or against these activities? And what uh, is important for the government? Yeah, it's very, very important, actually, question. This was one of the areas we looked, looked closely because we do have many people working abroad there and uh, many of them came. So obviously we took this very seriously. We established a program uh, whereby uh, there is an application on the phone. I think many countries did this, but uh, also uh, we did the same in Ukraine. They would install it once they actually closed, uh, crossed the border and then they will be monitored like uh, at home there. So they need to be under observation observation uh, as, 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 as we say. So they stay at home, but they need actually to stay at home for uh, a period of uh, up to two weeks uh, to make sure that uh, um, uh, to make sure that uh, um, uh, they uh, are not uh, pose a threat to others. Um, we uh, monitored and closed some of the uh, entrants on the border there, but we maintain open uh, those borders for with most of the countries, but we just uh, suggested that whoever comes back there, they need actually to also not to pose a threat to the general population. There, so and uh, this application uh, is uh, helping and it's working still right now. Um, in terms of the remittances, very uh, pain, well, very important actually question there. So far, until end of March, the remittances has been higher than uh, uh, compared to last year, but this was before coronavirus there. Uh, we uh, uh, created some of the programs where we want to, and then remittances are important, but more even important is that the people actually have jobs to uh, support their families there, because if uh, they cannot uh, work and uh, then this, this will become a, a not Ukrainian problem uh, only, but they will become a regional program there with many people unemployed. So far we have unemployment under control. That it, it is growing, so we um, um, uh, increased like the access to the unemployment benefits to a broader population, and we also introduced a program so-called temporary unemployment relief, whereby we compensate uh, uh, employers uh, for um, uh, employees who are not working full day. Uh, I think this was kind of. Can, can you repeat the last minute? You yeah. were completely frozen here. It's uh, uh, so-called, like as we call it, temporary unemployment support, whereby we uh, compensate the employers for paying employees' salaries uh, during a time of uh, quarantine uh, if the uh, businesses were closed or partly closed. So this also helps us to decrease the pressure on our employment and to help to jumpstart the economy uh, as fast as possible. I think this was a Ukrainian know-how uh, and it's showing quite good uh, promises and progress. How it works, if an employer, for example, a cafeteria or even a larger business there, they, because of coronavirus, need to send like 20% or 10% of people uh, home there, but they want to rehire, well, retake them uh, in one month or two after coronavirus, we say, don't lay them off we will pay, pay you up to minimum salary, obviously not the full salaries, uh, there uh, for the unemployed un, un, uh, amount. So if somebody is not working 40 hours a week, but is working 10 hours a week right now, so we would pay for this 30. And uh, this helps to uh, jumpstart the economy and also eases the pressure on the um, uh, state uh, uh, benefits there. But in terms of actually the uh, foreign, uh, the people who were working abroad, uh, obviously we are not closing the uh, borders there. So uh, we just want to be sure that, um, first of all, the countries actually where they are going, 
uh, need to be open to, 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 to take them. And second of all, we also need to be sure that we will not be actually having a, a commuting virus, as we call it, that the people will go there person and will come back in two days and that will be actually um, uh, a health disaster. So uh, that, that's why we introduced that once you cross the border back, you need to spend two weeks on a self-isolation at home. Uh, and we also have a program of uh, creation, uh, creating like 500,000 jobs in Ukraine. Uh, this more, um, we create conditions. Obviously, state does not create jobs, 500,000, but we stimulate creating conditions for uh, jobs. Uh, they're aiming aimed at uh, the people exactly who come from uh, European Union countries there and uh, who uh, right now cannot uh, find work. So far, the numbers are encouraging there. We do have the numbers of unemployment growing, but it's not drastic growth there. And we eased out the access. So we can be pretty much sure that who wants to apply for an employment benefit, they can uh, apply. So we introduced electronic- uh, Yeah, thank you very much. Let me turn to the fundamental question here, and that is, uh, it's not decided as yet, but when would you guess that uh, uh, Europeans will be allowed to enter Ukraine without uh, uh, two weeks of quarantine? And uh, when people from the US uh, can uh, enter Ukraine without two weeks of quarantine? What's your yeah, best guess? Uh, yeah, this, this is uh, uh, obviously a, a decision which will be made uh, in, in steps there. Um, I know. This, this will take, uh, this, this will be uh, done when we reopen the air travel completely. And this will be done on reciprocal basis with different countries, because right now also Ukrainians cannot travel. US is different there, but US is special uh, there. But uh, European yeah. Union mostly actually requires the same things, except they now say actually seasonal workers, please come. Uh, countries in Southern Europe, uh, like Greece, say, yeah, because they are depend on the tourism there. But we need to be careful in that. So uh, my uh, assumption that as soon as air travel will open, we will see ease of those restrictions uh, there. So we are talking about, uh, I, I think that the plan for the opening of air traffic is uh, 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 slightly like somewhere mid-June, but there will be likely more beginning of July when there will be more uh, frequent uh, travel and uh, ease out on conditions on air travel, which obviously will be result in the uh, accepting uh, already more normal rules uh, for, for travelers. But this decision again has not been made. We have this plan of reopening there, but we monitor on a 10 day increments. If we see that in 10 days after we open something, the situation is the same or improved, we do the next steps. If we see that there are worsening conditions, we either stop and postpone, or we can even come back and increase quarantine. That's nothing new. Every country in the world will do this. Uh, but so far we do see encouraging signs. As you've seen on Monday, we opened the subway in Kyiv, and Kyiv is actually yeah. is a huge city. So now we, uh, uh, we count uh, on this 10 day period to see that um, there are no increase in the uh, health risks. And uh, if not, then I think will be high probability they will come to the next step is out of travel uh, restrictions. Thank you very much. Let's hope so, so that we can come to yeah, uh, yes, Ukraine sure. soon again. Have been able to be there, be there since, uh, since uh, March. Um, uh, I've got another question here. You uh, uh, rightly said that uh, you have uh, managed to stop uh, uh, export controls that have been imposed in uh, Russia and Belarus and Romania for agricultural goods apart from uh, buckwheat. Uh, but um, there's now uh, a proposal to uh, stop import, or rather, uh, to uh, uh, in, in introduce uh, import quotas for fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And within Ukraine, uh, some of the fertilizers, uh, Dmitry Firstash has the monopoly on with uh, three um, uh, uh, factories. And this would drive us uh, 
the cost and with your substantial uh, background uh, in uh, agriculture, how do you look up on this and is this really coming? Yeah, this is a very sensitive question. There. And last week we have received lots of uh, press, I would say, and uh, discussions on uh, different sides there. So what uh, we are doing, and this is our general uh, approach to uh, those uh, situations that we uh, want to make right decisions there. So we do not want to make any politically motivated decisions at all, and we will not make them. So we took additional time to listen to all parties there and uh, to uh, get deeper into the analysis of, of, of the case. What is happening actually on this particular fertilizer cases? So there are uh, arguments on uh, one side and the, and the other side. On the one side, obviously there is a firtash actually, uh, mostly, not only, but there is mostly actually firtash uh, on the Ostchem enterprises there. Uh, on which anti-monopoly committee made a decision uh, some time ago that it needs to be separated and it is now in court. So technically speaking, the, the state did the right decision before. Now it's actually in the, in the court, but th this is actually a normal process in every country there. Uh, but this is something which uh, is important to say. Ostcam is there, but there are enterprises there. There are people actually who work on those businesses there. And uh, the, uh, there is a market uh, that consists like on the uh, fertilizers that, that uh, nitrogen based is mostly like um, Ukrainian produced. It's about 70% Ukrainian produced, 30% like international. And there is the complex, uh, co the, those, the uh, complex, I think they complex, uh, yeah, complex, complex uh, fertilizers, fertilizers there, 15%. whereby 85% is import and 15% is the local production there. And uh, the complex is even more in uh, fertilizers, more in value there because they are more important. So um, what do we want to actually, plus there are Russians there and uh, most supplies, although they're coming from the EU, they still come from Russia in diff, I mean, this is actually the case in different uh, formats there uh, through European Union countries there, but this is still a Russian uh, businesses and supplies. Um, so there is actually a little bit complex uh, situation to view it. Uh, we uh, want to achieve two things. First of all, we wanna make sure that those uh, enterprises will not close in Ukraine because this will not be the right thing. We understand that they are at least less competitive a little bit because they get gas now from European Union there. So it's at least as expensive as in the EU. Second of all, there are 5,000 or more people working in those enterprises and they represent uh, a sector, which obviously we do not want to be closed uh, for any reasons, whether they are owned by Firtas or anyone else, because that's not the right way to do. Third, it's also in the interest of uh, Ukrainian agricultural uh, producers to have the, uh, um, uh, the balance there. Fourth, we realize that we cannot uh, allow uh, monopolization in the Ukrainian market. We cannot allow uncontrolled increase in prices there because this would hurt everyone, especially agricultural producers and the competition. So um, we are not making actually uh, fast or harsh decisions right now. But we are debating with all parties there. So including the uh, re representatives of European Union, uh, there are actually uh, also involvement from the United States, from Ukrainian Agro Association, from the uh, Association of Chemists there. And with all that, we would like to come up to a decision which will be in the benefit of uh, the country and of the agriculture process itself, taking into account that the prices uh, obviously should not be uh, manipulated because there are quotas or anything like that. So this will not be actually the decision or we introduce quota and that's it. And uh, that this would not be that kind of decision. It is not made. And we invite, I mean, if someone is interested like from this audience to participate and uh, this, th this is what we would do. Taras Kachka is here with me there. So say hello there. <laughs> It's my Hello. deputy <laughs> that is responsible as well for all those negotiations and lead all those discussions. We know him. He has been accused on two sides already that he's supporting Russian interests. On the other case, he's not supporting Russian interests. 
the, so, but we want to do the right thing. Like, as I said, like at the beginning, the Minister of Economy should do the rules of the game and not politically charged because somebody actually presses or pushes uh, on different fronts. So uh, I think uh, all the market will be satisfied with the decision we make there because this would be the right decision. We will explain it why we are making it and uh, we will monitor uh, how it is implemented and done. Well, I hope this means that there won't be any uh, quotas for <laughs> fertilizer. Well, I, I hear you. Let okay. me uh, continue. I have a question here from uh, uh, Jim Broke, and he says, uh, two years from now, if you look back, what uh, sectors of Ukraine's economy will have proved to be the most promising uh, for investors? Well, uh, obviously, I uh, strongly believe that it should be innovative sectors there. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, it's uh, those sectors which relate to IT, but IT is already not the right word. So we have lots of IT specialists there. They actually are well paid. They generate lots of work for uh, European Union, for US, especially companies for Canadians there. But we are talking about moving further uh, uh, um, in, into the creating clusters there whereby not individual IT specialists create some product for outsourcing, this should continue and should grow. But whereby the, uh, and I think this also a perfect area for investments, creating a new clusters. I'm not saying like Google right now or uh, the um, uh, Microsoft uh, in the old days or other there, but I'm talking actually about uh, uh, clusters whereby there will be uh, specialist in the industry working, uh, creating a, uh, not a product already, but uh, some new innovations there. Something actually which we do, but it's done more on a case by case basis there. And this is something where we, we can start to contribute to the world. Final product, not actually that US is asking actually, oh, please make a code mm -hmm. or part of that but creating a, a new iPhone, a new, uh, um, uh, I don't know, like some virtual reality, a new, uh, like there are several examples, like uh, Grammarly and uh, like those phones and others, final products, because we have the potential, we have the people there. And now uh, I think those people can come together and with the right investments and the right management uh, from international, uh, uh, guys and private tech with the organization, they can start creating those areas by bringing 10, 20, 100, 50, 200 people, creating a product and then selling those companies to international uh, counterparts uh, uh, that uh, are interested in integrating those and will be based in Ukraine. So this is something which I think is the most promising there, uh, just as an area for um, innovation and where we do have um, uh, competitive advantage. Uh, second, uh, I, I'm, as, as you under said, um, I, we are the Ministry of Everything and uh, industrial and agriculture there, so I need to say something in agriculture. I think uh, Ukrainian agriculture potential is well uh, still under uh, explored and there is a great area which is irrigation in the south and it is huge. You know, like in California, where they have like two harvests there, and uh, Ukraine, we also can have uh, much higher yields in southern areas of Ukraine, which are currently underinvested. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, actually, have lots of issues with droughts and everything there, but have the best probably land uh, by quality of soil, but no um, uh, access to irrigation. Uh, we uh, want to, there, there used to be 2.5 million hectares under irrigation under the Soviet Union. Not efficient there, lots of water wasted. Now technologies are different there. Now we have around 300,000 only. So obviously uh, some areas left with Crimea, but we still have, uh, it's even what was there already. Just this is the area with the privatization of land now being opened. Uh, not moratorium being lifted and the market will be open. This is something which can actually people start to think because in irrigation, you need to invest. Um, uh, if you use like the technologies from United States, this is one technology. There is, I, I know that because, you know, I, I worked in this sector for some time. There is also a, a technology from Israel there, which are more um, 
I would say uh, there is less water in Israel. So obviously there is more efficient there. There is a little bit more water in the United States. So there's less efficient there, but um, it, it's a combination. All, obviously will be all, all, all factors there, but this is something which is a great area because we can get very high returns, very high yields. And we as a state uh, see this as a priority for development. This create, will create enormous amount of jobs in the South and it will actually increase significantly the production uh, in those areas uh, by 2 million or, 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 or 4 million uh, tons easily then. What about oh, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the European uh, Association sorry. Agreement, uh, the European supply chain? Is that a big issue? Uh, Integration uh, into the European supply chain. I will ask Taras actually to comment there. So. Yeah, thank, thank you. I think on, on your European supply chain, it's, it's constantly increasing in, in both in industry and agriculture. In agriculture, I think that the, we have one simple indicator that we now exporting to the EU about 15 million uh, millions of ton of uh, corn, uh, which is used for feeding animals. And so that's all uh, a lot of meat and uh, dairy products uh, in the EU are produced with uh, feeding animals with Ukrainian corn. So it's like a systemic cooperation and we have other examples of this. On industrial level, it is uh, it is less visible, but uh, the uh, one of best example is uh, um, the car clusters, a cluster in the Western, Western Ukraine with a set of companies supplying different spare parts to Germany to for car production. And uh, we see that this uh, car cluster is uh, illustrated that how Ukrainian economy can is uh, uh, adapting itself to, to new circumstances because they survive the uh, extremely um, let's say the de deficit of workforce when people uh, actually immigrated to, to Poland for, for, for economic reasons. And otherwise, they also survive the higher or, Higher salaries and uh, uh, and uh, uh, say more costly hryvnia last last year when then the cost of production increased in Ukraine. So uh, and they continue to be stable stable supplier of spare parts to 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 Europe. And this is like an example of other industries where the supply chain is is let's say we are more and more integrated to to the EU like economic universe. I will just add like two things that uh, obviously like those crisis now is the uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, obviously those uh, this crisis is now um, as well the uh, opportunity for us. So what we are hearing and this is more from you even with United States and with European Union, but I also would like to comment that uh, United States uh, is um, discussing and obviously in many countries discussing um, new world, uh, not order, probably too hard word for that, but uh, uh, trade order there. And there are many challenges now whether EU and US should continue to have such big reliance uh, on um, uh, production in certain Asian countries there. So we are working right now already with several initiatives from United States whereby the uh, businesses uh, say that they would like to consider alternative production um, areas there. This includes automotive, this includes pharmaceutical uh, there, and uh, there is a realization it will be maybe, will be more expensive than in China because China efficiency obviously is very high right now. Uh, there and the volumes obviously. But uh, this is something they want actually for diversification. Obviously, we are more than open to take those additional opportunities and to be more integrated there. So we will do everything possible uh, to attract such interest there and to provide the best conditions possible uh, for those uh, creating big <coughs> clusters of production in Ukraine to be integrated more into supply chains with European Union. Because so far, uh, we, we realize that the protection is, is also there and that uh, the most of the uh, uh, concentration will be that bring uh, production into our own countries, into the EU and US, but not all productions can be taken. And we hope that our EU association agreement will be able to utilize in the proper way 
in order uh, bring some of the productions uh, uh, to uh, from uh, the countries, not naming those countries, but we all understand what we're talking about, to uh, Ukraine in particular. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions here. One from uh, about uh, state support for enterprises. One from uh, Jean de uh, Barbosa. Uh, an important issue in European countries concerned with small and medium sized enterprises. How can you assure their uh, liquidity and allow them to go through the crisis? So, this is a COVID uh, crisis uh, a question. And what measures in this regard have you undertaken? And a similar question from Robert Kirchner, which is a bit broader. Uh, 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 what are you doing about state loan guarantees to en enterprises in the COVID crisis? Uh, I, I, I couldn't hear like, the first uh, question there. So you're from the first is uh, state uh, support for small and medium sized enterprises in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. In Ukraine, of course. Yes. What, yeah, uh, this is the is a government big... doing. Yeah, this is a big uh, priority for us. And uh, so far we responded by uh, one big program there. I, I will not comment already on this temporary unemployment because this also supports uh, all kinds of enterprises in the time of uh, need there, but primarily by retaining employees and paying for those employees. But um, we also uh, re- uh, uh, well, restructured uh, uh, the uh, 579 so-called program, uh, which allows access to, uh, uh, to credit uh, uh, for um, small uh, and medium enterprises. They're more like small enterprises, but anyway, uh, we made it actually changed it so they can apply if they have loans already in the bank, so they can apply to the bank and receive for one year a zero interest rate on their loans. They are subsidized by the state. Uh, so far, this program is still actually uh, rolling there. So the banks are very slow on responding there. So, but we're trying to uh, uh, make sure that uh, they are responding to it uh, properly. But this is a program which already is on the table and uh, this should be very helpful. Potentially up to 30 billion grivenas in loans or even more 40 can be um, uh, restructured in that way. And this is especially for micro and small businesses there. Uh, we have the second program, which we are discussing, uh, will not be discussing, it's on the table, but in order for, for, for this, we need a change in the legislation. And we uh, submitted this to the Verkhovna Rada, whereby uh, there will be new rules for uh, providing the government guarantees. So, uh, so far the government guarantees can be provided only for individual loans. We wanna utilize the practice which exists in the EU and the United States and other countries, whereby such guarantees can be applied for a portfolio of loans. What it means, if the Home Narada supports us, uh, government will be able, Minister of Finance will be able to provide guarantees to the banks uh, on part of the portfolios. So uh, this also the primary, the primary idea, uh, idea is to utilize it for micro and uh, small businesses there. Because right now, uh, it's very difficult for them, impossible to get any support. Government has limited resources in the budget. Also, we supplied different incentives and we are preparing a larger presentation to show what we've done already there, but has limited resources going forward uh, in the government, in, in the budget there. So what we wanna do, uh, we wanna um, uh, transfer uh, some of the risks from the banks uh, towards uh, um, programs and, or enterprises which government uh, thinks is important. And m micro and small businesses, exactly this area. So we say, please continue to lend to the small uh, and micro businesses. Please continue actually provide them uh, with a low interest rate, which will subsidize, not for all, but for the cluster. I'm against actually supporting individual enterprise because this is corruption mm -hmm. and everything. But we are talking about clusters and that you, what your question you're asking, asking exactly about clusters, micro and small businesses as a class for everyone. The, uh, because it's important for Ukrainian uh, economy to have those people supported, to, to have them continue produce, continue to provide services. So this is the idea, if we get support from the government, those uh, guarantees will be extended to the banks will share, not take 100%, will share the risk with the banks, but the banks will share the risk with the state. And by that way, they will be able to provide 
uh, such needed financing uh, um, uh, to the micro and uh, uh, small businesses. There are some other discussions, but they are not in this such advanced stage. But uh, I would hope uh, actually for the support of international community on that, of uh, expanding um, uh, funds uh, which can uh, be uh, supportive towards businesses, meaning there, for example, that uh, state, whereby state would uh, provide uh, like one billion uh, dollars or euros to the fund, international IFIs. EBRD, IFC, uh, OPIC uh, provides the same amount of money there. This fund will be managed actually as the, uh, by proper uh, corporate governance uh, standards. And this fund will be providing actually guarantees to the commercial banks on the international accepted uh, principles to important areas there. This can be export operations there. This can be uh, IT clusters. Uh, this can be um, uh, some infrastructure uh, areas like the ports or roads. Uh, this can be renovation of uh, energy sectors uh, there in terms of the assets uh, there. Uh, this can be uh, energy efficiency there like of uh, usage and uh, for personal use. So this kind of using multiplicator there, because that's how always was done uh, when the country was in crisis. And Ukraine is in crisis, not because of coronavirus. We are historically in crisis there, and so far we are not growing there. We've done many right things already. We have big achievements on the corporate governance. We have big achievements actually on the, uh, the registration of uh, property rights, uh, on uh, even on the court system there. We have big uh, achievements there. We yeah, but uh, Igor, let me stop, stop you here Please? on corporate governance, but we are seeing now a massive uh, threat. You mm -hmm. had a, b a big salary for good reason in the private sector before, and you had to take a big cut now to about $1,700 a month, uh, 47,000 per month, and 10 times the minimum salary, which is now the maximum salary for uh, uh, government employees and also for state enterprise uh, managers. As you know, as I'm, and coming from the private sector, this is madness. This is uh, driven by your president, I'm afraid, and uh, he is uh, pursuing this uh, populist line in repeated uh, uh, speeches. This cannot uh, be uh, con uh, continue. If mm -hmm. uh, this will happen, uh, the people who work in the top state positions, either in government or in, uh, in uh, enterprises, apart from a few top uh, people perhaps, will either be competent or incompetent or uh, corrupt. What can you do in order to get the order in this business? Uh, I can comment quite easily on that uh, because uh, first of all, it's a, it was a temporary decision uh, for during coronavirus uh, response. Um, this was done uh, just to obviously for uh, important reasons there, but to make sure that the government employees was not intended for supervisory boards in particular there, was intended for all government employees there, that they need actually to take as well part of the uh, uh, cuts in terms of actually uh, responding to a general economic situation when people are laid off from work, when there are lots of unemployments and businesses are closing. But this is, and it is voted, and it is actually a temporarily coronavirus mess. So this 47,000 grievances, which you are saying, is not done uh, forever. It's only during coronavirus uh, response. So uh, at least this is actually what uh, we are having here as a discussion there. It's, it's not a discussion. That's actually the rule of law at this point of time. Uh, this is coronavirus response measure there. And I fully agree with you that, I mean, to continue uh, uh, on that, and, and, and not even for government employees. Government employees uh, obviously should be more uh, restraining there because uh, it's a little bit different uh, situation. But the supervisory board is a little bit different there because you want to employ uh, uh, people who need to contribute there. And many of them actually come from businesses and everywhere. And uh, this is a little bit different there. And obviously, state-run enterprises should be compensated properly uh, on a market base. 
So obviously we cannot say that this would be, there has been some overreach uh, there, which created negative, maybe public opinion that, but uh, in say what 90%, this was the right uh, um, trend. And uh, we do have, uh, we right now also having some of the uh, new appointments there, like on the state enterprise, and we are signing higher salaries there. Obviously, they are not right now in effect until there is 47 southern uh, limitation, but um, that uh, will be uh, lifted uh, once the uh, quarantine is in. Thank you very much. Let's really hope that it uh, is temporary and nothing else. I have here a question from Ambassador William Courtney. The Ukrainian government uh, has said uh, the Prozori uh, uh, e-government uh, program has saved its several billion uh, dollars. Investors see uh, Prozori as a successful anti-corruption program. Uh, how do you look upon the Prozori for the, the future? Will it be expanded? We have here small-scale privatization that has been expanded to. We are also seeing that Prozori does not work in certain areas, for example, consultancy services or the sales of uh, deposit guarantee fund uh, assets, which are very difficult to, uh, to assess in value. And you uh, have also talked about it that uh, yeah. uh, in certain cases, industrial policy run against it, that um, you want localization. So what's your overall attitude to Prozoro for the future? Uh, I think there was actually some of the, my words has been misinterpreted all the time there. So. Prozoro is a great system there. So when I was actually coming in 2014 before, uh, not, not in Prozoro, but I had something similar in mind for the state tax administration when I was running actually in this uh, concourse uh, there. And uh, this system allows actually separation from um, uh, decision maker from uh, the uh, people who actually who benefit and who participate in the tent uh, and uh, provides access on a very simple basis to the a large uh, number of participants uh, there on indiscriminate basis. So it's it's a good, nice system. Uh, but what is important actually to change there? So not in the Prozoro itself. Prozoro is an algorithm. It's a machine. It runs on the uh, uh, assumptions and rules. And right now with Taras as well, uh, we are working and uh, analyzing uh, our international commitments in terms of the EU trade agreement in primarily, less WTO, uh, but still um, there. And uh, to uh, pinpoint some of the areas whereby we can add uh, additional criteria to stimulate uh, localization of production in Ukraine. This is what is done, and we have this analysis in the EU countries, it is allowed on the EU-Ukraine international trade agreements uh, and the WTO everywhere. So we are saying, not for Ukrainian companies there, but we are saying for whoever wants to, for example, if you, if you create locomotives there, if you want to sell locomotives there, if you are an uh, you, you, um, international US European company there, you compete there. Uh, if you make a commitment to localize like 20%, then this is worth something. This is not only like purely a uh, price competition anymore. So if you say I invest, people will actually pay salaries to the country there. <clears throat> this is actually what is uh, quite normal. So we are thinking on those solutions uh, to uh, uh, help localization in response, in, in, regardless whether it is a Ukrainian company or uh, international company. There. But in terms of Prozoro, it's, it's a great system that it's, I mean, there might be actually some areas uh, to improve there, but I'm not competent actually to, this, to address them and to discuss. So there are some experts probably who should do that, but uh, I don't have complaints on uh, Prozoro per se there, but I have complaints in terms of actually the uh, criteria uh, we, we, we use uh, uh, there because there are some ab ab absurd situations there like I mean I can mm. explain that the absurd situation in uh, when uh, uh, the the Ukrainian companies have to uh, provide damping in order or who have localization uh, provide lower prices in order to win uh, the, the, the trade there. so it's shouldn't be like that so we 
should uh, and we participate in international trade and that's very important there and i think this actually has to grow there but at the same time we need to be balanced there. that's what united states as well is doing in very european union country we need to make sure that and, and that's in the interest of everybody that our balance of export and import uh, balance and that there is stimulus as well for uh, big companies like samsung like google like everyone to also come to ukraine and will not only create like the um some uh, priorities. We as well create conditions there. So come to Ukraine, work. This is will be better there. Plus, you will be better positioned actually to participate in some of the uh, on a transparent basis in uh, those international uh, and, and 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 local trades. We clearly clearly don't want actually to create a situation like it was in Russia there, like in the, some period of time when actually they created this localization and when the the helicopter would come there and they would actually bring wheels and uh, increase price 30 percent this would not be this this so we're working <laughs> on a very sensitive basis but uh this needs to be done and uh, we already identified some areas which are clearly allowed and are done and pursued by eu in their respective countries and we want to actually do this as well uh, here and it's again in the interest of everyone that ukrainian gdp will grow and then this there is no other way as to provide additional resources. One resource obviously yeah. is actually stimulating uh, a little bit better access to public finance, uh, maintaining at the same time competition and uh, equal access uh, to all uh, international community, not Ukrainian companies. Thank you. I think this is a very good note to uh, end to. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister Petrashko. We have reached uh, oh. the, the full hour and I think- very that, quick. Uh, the, the listen, listeners have got a lot of uh, uh, good information and, and clear views from you in a very lively discussion. Uh, I have to apologize to the people who have posed questions. Many of them very good, but we didn't have time for all of them. But uh, you have a big area to cover. You have done so very well, but there's a lot, uh, a lot more uh, to discuss. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Minister Pitraska, and also thank you very much, uh, First Deputy Minister uh, Skarska, for your uh, uh, contribution. It has been a, a great pleasure, and I hope uh, that all you participants have uh, benefited greatly from this, as I have. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Thank you very much. Tell all the participants. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.